So far, we've included the government in our circular flow diagram as just a place that collects taxes and pays out subsidies. But governments do a lot more than take money from some people and give it to other people. They're also directly engaged in making purchases in output markets just like households are. And part of the reason for that is that governments provide what we call public goods. Now to understand what a public good is, it's best to start by being really clear about what we mean by a private good. Private goods are the kinds of goods we've implicitly been dealing with whenever we've talked about trade in output markets. And one of the fundamental characteristics of a private good is that it is subject to what we call rivalry. Or sometimes we'll say that a private good is rivalrous. What we mean by that is private goods are the kinds of goods that either one person consumes or another person consumes, but two people can't both consume the good. If I go out and I buy a sandwich, I can consume that sandwich, or I can give it to you to consume, or maybe we can split it, but each part of that sandwich can only be consumed by one of us. In that sense, it is rivalrous. Either you get it, or I get it. We can't both get it. And we already know a lot about how private goods are allocated in competitive output markets. We know that somewhere there's a market demand curve that sums up all the individual demand curves and a market supply curve that sums up all the firm supply curves that are made up of portions of marginal cost curves. And where those intersect, we get the equilibrium price. We could then have different kinds of consumers with different demand curves. We might have one consumer who has a demand curve like this, or another consumer that has a demand curve like this. But each of those consumers is going to take the price that's set in the market as given, and that price becomes their marginal cost of consuming the good. And what they'll want to do is set the marginal cost equal to the marginal benefit, which is captured in their demand curves. So they'll take that single price as given and find where that price, that marginal cost, intersects their demand, their marginal benefit, with the first consumer ending up consuming this quantity and the second consumer ending up consuming this quantity. So in these competitive private goods markets, everyone faces a single price, and then everyone chooses different quantities depending on their demand curves, depending on their marginal benefits. Now let's think about a public good. So a public good is the opposite. Rather than being characterized by rivalry, it's characterized by what we call non-rivalry. Or sometimes we'll say that public goods are non-rivalrous. What we mean by that is that public goods are the kinds of goods that many people can consume at the same time. Think of a city putting up fireworks and some national holiday. I can look up at the sky and enjoy those fireworks. But my neighbor can also look up at the same sky and enjoy those same fireworks and I won't enjoy them any less just because my neighbor is also looking up at the sky. And the same is true for tens of thousands of other people who are within the geographic area where they can look up at the sky and see the fireworks. So fireworks are characterized by non-rivalry, at least within the geographic area that they can be viewed from. They can be consumed by many people at the same time. And one person's consumption doesn't take away from another person's consumption. So if we then were to draw a similar graph, we could again think about two different consumers with two different demand curves for this public good, for the fireworks. Maybe this demand curve and this demand curve. But unlike the case of private goods, there isn't some competitive market give, that gives rise to a price which forms the marginal cost and then consumers choose different quantities of the good. There's a single quantity of fireworks that the city is producing. Somehow that single quantity is being determined by someone, like the city in our example. 
and everybody consumes that single quantity. If we wanted then to figure out, well, what's the marginal benefit of the last unit of fireworks that went up for different people, we'd get different answers for different people. This first consumer would have a marginal benefit of that last unit equal to this. And the second consumer would have a higher marginal benefit of that last unit of fireworks that's put up into the sky. And if we wanted it to be the case that each consumer pays a cost equal to their marginal benefit, we'd have to set different prices. We'd have to set a price for the first consumer that's less than the price for the second consumer. So unlike the case of a private market, we have a single quantity, not a single price. Everybody consumes the same quantity of fireworks that the city put up. And if we wanted for marginal benefit to be equal to the individual marginal cost that each person pays to watch those fireworks, we'd get, we'd set different prices equal to those different marginal benefits. So in that sense, you can look at the two pictures and see that the role of quantities and prices is reversed in the two pictures. In the private market, we have a single price and people choose different quantities. In the public goods market, we have a single quantity and people are assigned different prices if we want them to pay a price equal to their marginal benefit. We can also think about what's efficient in the two kinds of cases. And we already know a lot about what's efficient for private goods. In the absence of externalities, we know that competitive markets result in the maximum social surplus. They do that by setting that single price that's then causing the marginal benefit in the equilibrium for the first person to be equal to the marginal benefit for the second person. And that, in turn, is equal to the marginal cost of producing that last good, which is captured in the supply curve in the market. So this condition is satisfied in the competitive equilibrium, and that condition implies what we call efficiency, or maximum social surplus. Well, what would that condition look like in the case of public goods? In the case of public goods, everybody consumes the same good. Each person gets a marginal benefit. So in order for the total marginal benefit of the good to be equal to the marginal cost, we'd have to add the marginal benefit that the first person gets to the marginal benefit that the second person gets. And if there are more people, we'd have to add more marginal benefits to figure out the total benefit of this good in society. And then we'd want to produce a quantity so that the sum of those marginal benefits is equal to the marginal cost. So when we figure out how much to produce, how many fireworks to put up, we'd want to set that quantity so that we get to a point where the sum of the marginal benefits is equal to the marginal cost of providing those fireworks. If we reach that point, then that would imply efficiency. The social marginal benefit, the sum of all the benefits, is equal to the social marginal cost, how much it costs to actually put the last unit of fireworks into the sky.